Uh, so I can trace back my writing roots to growing up uh, in outstate Minnesota in Watertown. Um, I think I've always been drawn to stories. I was an avid reader as a young boy. Um, and then I started doing some writing uh, and was encouraged by uh, an elementary school teacher, uh, Miss Chambers, if she's out there, hello. Um, and one of the things that we had to do was we had these books, which were uh, about Johnny Applegate who was sort of a know-it-all kid who did everything correctly. Um, and I think they were ultimately given to us in our uh, elementary school readers to sort of make us more moral children and more well-behaved. Uh, but Miss Chambers wanted us to be able to uh, write our own version of them that were sort of unfettered by uh, what had been happening in the books. So she gave us an assignment that was basically like letting us do whatever we wanted with Johnny Applegate. And um, I had Johnny Applegate go to prison. And while he was in prison, he actually uh, got a hold of some uh, shoelaces and hung himself. Uh, and the reaction that ended up happening, all of my classmates loved that story. Um, and that was sort of the springboard for me to start writing and realizing that people would react to what I was doing. Um, I, got, I had to go visit the school psychologist after that for a little while. Um, but that didn't really bother me as much. Uh, I like the reaction that I was getting from my writing uh, from people around me. And then I sort of continued to do that uh, all through high school um, and continued to get pretty good reactions from other people. So that was sort of the, the initial part of my writing, uh, I guess, apprenticeship. Um, when I got to college, I went to the U of M and I ended up uh, going and majoring in English and uh, studied with a couple of really great writers, uh, Alex Pate uh, among them, who was really instrumental in uh, sort of guiding my way. My writing style ends up to be sort of humorous with, uh, you know, humorous and poignant. I'm trying to sort of bridge that those two things and he was really instrumental in sort of helping me work on craft issues and trying to find my voice. Um, after uh, the university I ended up uh, taking a lot of classes at the Loft Literary Center uh, and studied with um, a couple of great teachers there as well, chief among them uh, Jeremy Norton uh, who is actually a firefighter and teaching some writing on the side while also being a firefighter. And, you know, he, he taught me a bunch of other stuff that has been useful to me. Um, and just sort of the support of the loft has really been instrumental in my writing career as well. Uh, after I had taken a couple classes there, I ended up uh, going and uh, living in Italy for a while. Uh, while I was there, sort of wrote uh, a lot, and a lot of that stuff I don't think will ever be seen by anybody, but it was just a lot of pages that needed to get done, and that, you know, I was sort of working things out in my mind and finding my voice. Um, after that, I came back uh, and ended up uh, winning the Loft Mentor Series. Uh, I don't have an MFA, uh, but that was a year-long intensive program uh, with a lot of vi different visiting writers coming, and that ended up sort of being what I consider my Master's in Fine Arts, uh, and so 
there was a lot of study there and a lot of community that sort of uh, coalesced around our year. Uh, and we got, you know, it ended up being a great year for me to sort of my confidence as a writer and sort of finding a community of writers within the Twin Cities. Uh, we, after that year, I started sort of, I guess, becoming more public writer, uh, doing readings and events, and then uh, started getting things started getting things published. Uh, so it's probably been in about the last ten years that I've started publishing a lot of short stories, and uh, they sort of range from little short comedic pieces that are. 500 words or less, and then sort of longer things that are you know, between 12 and 25 pages long. Uh, my first collection came out, it's entitled If You Lived Here You'd Already Be Home, uh, and that came out in 2009. Uh, Pretty decent reviews. It was published by Replacement Press, which uh, was uh, is in St. Paul, now actually defunct, but uh, that was their first book that they put out. Uh, and then my second book um, was uh, let's see, put out by Paper Darts Press called Get In If You Want to Live, and that was a combination of 19 flash stories and combined with uh, 19 artists interpreting that work. Uh, so there's a really great book with you know, a bunch of my little short stories and then a, uh, a company of artists interpreting all of those. So a lot of the stories are pretty funny, so the art ends up being pretty crazy and funny as well. Uh, my third uh, book, will be out from Soft Skull Press in March of next year. Uh, it's called Knockout. Uh, and it's a full-length book, and it's the first one that I've uh, had sort of published by National Press, uh, which is great, and sort of, sort of built up to that, I guess. Um, along the way, I've won a couple of grants and things like that. And it was, I won a McKnight, uh, Loft McKnight grant in 2010, and I've won a couple of State Parks Board grants and a couple of other things like that, which have been sort of instrumental to find uh, me writing time and sort of protected time to write and uh, make you know, art as I can within the realms of my day. Uh, so those have sort of been the things. Uh, this new book, uh, it's pretty exciting in the end because there's, you know, I actually get the, um, the sort of muscle behind the decent press to get it out into the world, uh, whereas I haven't really had that before. Um, I'm just sort of doing a lot of this stuff on my own. Uh, I've learned ton about the book industry in the last you know, probably five years after my first book came out, so I'm able to sort of navigate those worlds pretty easily now. Uh, I live uh, in Northeast Minneapolis in Linden Park and uh, have a son, Theo, who's four, and uh, my wife, Katie, who is a musician and who works with the Fail Center for Music. Uh, I think that's probably largely my writing trajectory. Uh, I think that um, a lot of my sort of uh, humor in my writing comes from my father, uh, who I sort of remember he did a lot of sort of advertising type work, and I remember him uh, 
sitting uh, at a table and sort of writing. They had these cartoons within our old community newspaper where you could win $25 if you uh, wrote the caption for a cartoon. And I remember him sitting, you know, for a couple hours on a Saturday afternoon and uh, writing those. Those are sort of my, I guess, first memories of someone modeling, uh, writing, and working on craft and like how long it took to get something exactly right. And he ended up winning a lot of the, you know, a lot of $25 gift certificates to the grocery store. So um, I think that's a lot of where my sense of humor and sort of having someone model uh, writing for me initially started. Um, and I've had a lot of other good mentors uh, within my family. Uh, my aunt Susan uh, worked in the publishing world in New York for a long time, so she has sort of been instrumental in helping me uh, deal with uh, a lot of the stuff that I had to deal with at the beginning of my literary career. And my mother is pretty creative as well, so I think there are a lot of uh, sort of factors that fed into me becoming a writer. Uh, and it's sort of, I don't know if a lot of other people may think this, but I don't know if there's really anything else that I would be good at. Uh, and I, I wonder if a lot of artists end up sort of thinking that, you know, there's, there's things I could do and things that Writing makes me the happiest, and it's the thing that I know that I'm the best at. Uh, so that probably is why I sort of gravitated towards that. And, you know, I think for a while I was maybe, you know, in my early 20s, maybe fighting that a little bit, um, and maybe thinking about going into something more practical. But in the end, I think my the talent that I had and sort of the work that I had already put in sort of made those things appear to me. Lots of people couldn't handle the economic uncertainty of the writer's life. How, how, how have you made your peace with that? Well, I mean, I've made my peace with it. Like, during my early years, I had sort of a dream that I was actually going to be able to write full-time without having an actual job. Um, at some point, I realized the futility of that um, and ended up, you know, I, I work at the university in administration, the University of Minnesota in the administration. Um, doing grants administration and it's you know probably for the last 15 years I've had a day job and then did my writing on the side um, sort of at odd hours or when I you know could ever just squirrel away an hour or something to work on it um, so I've gotten pretty efficient in that regard and another thing you know Minnesota is a great state to sort of be an uh, emerging writer. There are a lot of grants available, and uh, there's a sort of a good community around uh, to, to help guide your way. I've, you know, the economic uncertainties, you know, also it, it really helps having a spouse who has a full-time job that can sort of help me be a little bit underemployed, uh, and you know, I I have been pretty good at figuring out how to get the grant money, and you know, I've made some money off my writing, uh, but it's never ever been enough where I can say, oh well, I'm gonna stop working full time, um, and I think I've realized that that is going to be how it's going to be forever sort of giving myself over to that fact. How does it work 
to schedule writing around a full-time job? Yeah, I mean, I think essentially you have to want to do it more than you want to like go out and have a drink with your friends. Um, there ends up being a lot of sacrifice that ends up happening you know, where it would be great if you, I could go watch a movie instead of doing this, but there's something sort of compelling me to, to write. And so, you know, in the end, I want to do it more than I want to do other things. So if there ends up being, you know, an extra hour where I stay up a little later or, you know, for midnight oil, then that's what ends up happening. Um, there, you know, I've done a couple of residencies where I can get away for like a couple weeks at a time. And that ends up being a spot where I can really devote myself to exclusively to work. And that ends up being where I can sort of get a lot of pages done, finish a lot of projects. Uh, and I try to schedule one of those like maybe once a year or something. So if you know, there's little snippets of stuff that I've started, I can sort of take those and make them bigger and you know, deepen any of the work that I've been doing and sort of figure out how things are connecting with the story. The, um, I mean, I think a lot of it ends up boiling down to you know, sacrifice. Do you want to make the sacrifice to do this? Um, or would you like to do something else? And some, you know, I, like everybody else, sometimes I give in to temptation and go do something else. Yeah. One spouse has a certain amount of claim also. But yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, there, it's, it's been a different dynamic also having a child now where it's you know, another person who is asking for attention and who I want to spend time with a lot. Um, so it, it's been kind of a juggling act for the last couple of years. This, you know, I was sort of envisioning after my first book was done in 2010 that I would immediately you know, have another one ready to go in like you know, a year and that took about five years so like there there's a little bit of time sort of figuring out how to manage time within the family and with work commitments and things like that so it, it took a little bit more time uh, to finish this last book than I thought it was going to What's your motivation for doing this? Um, I'm kind of a type A personality, so, I mean, first of all, I like people reading my work. That's quite important to me. Um, but once I start sort of into a story, I end up needing it to sort of be I guess a word I would use is sort of clean and concise. Um, once I start working on something, I need to feel like whatever I'm searching for within the story ends up being sort of fixed and um, that it makes sense to me. And I don't know why that is, but I'm sort of obsessed with that. If I really get into a story, it ends up being, you know, where I'm looking to find where these characters are going and sort of their motivations behind their actions. And that's pretty interesting to me. Um, and also sort of seeing where the character goes sort of on their own um, without my guidance. Uh, that's something that I have always sort of enjoyed is like the not knowing of what exactly
anything is going to happen within the story. Uh, I, I'm pretty, I'm a pretty organic writer. You know, usually I start with just a sentence that is sort of compelling to me, and everything sort of flows from there. And I don't usually have a really good idea about where anything is going until like I, you know, I get really into the story. And even then, things sort of you know, deviate from where I thought something was going, or I'll pull some sort of linchpin that ends up making things go in a more interesting way. Um, I mean, I think ultimately, I like sort of figuring things out and tinkering with things, and writing really gives me the opportunity to do that. Um, and another part of that is, I think, in a lot of ways, I wanted to be more of a comedian, um, but I'm sort of deathly scared of getting up on stage and having, you know, nothing there for me to like reference. You know, I, I do a lot of performance stuff now where I can like, you know, just read piece of paper in front of me and I've gotten pretty good at that but um, sort of I, I guess a lot of this is an outlet for things that I think are funny um, that I would have maybe tried to do if I was more gregarious I would try to do like on stage but this is sort of how I'm able to express myself in a humorous manner uh, instead of Where do your characters come from? Um, I think, I don't know, this is one of the, a lot, like I, like I said before, a lot of my stories sort of come from that first sentence, and then I am figuring out who is maybe saying that sentence, and like what, what they end up, um, where they are in their lives, what would have made them say this sentence, and then I sort of follow things from there. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of stories come out of me that way, and I don't know why that does flows for me like that, but I don't ever really set out thinking of a particular character who's this age, or, you know, that I'm you know, going through some, like, some sort of character inventory list. It all sort of flows from that first sentence of the story, and then I sort of try to figure out who exactly is saying that, why they're saying that, where they are in their lives, and things like that. Do you recognize eventually people you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, it's hard as a writer to not sort of pull in characteristics of people you know within your characters. I, you know, I think there have been a couple times where people may have recognized themselves in a couple of my characters. It doesn't happen as much as um, I think other writers may do that because a lot of my writing is so, like, it ends up sort of skewing towards the bizarre that maybe people don't end up wanting to see themselves in, the, in those characters, and the things that my characters end up doing are uh, sort of bizarre enough that like a lot of people that I know wouldn't ever do these things. I mean, they're, the characters are in sort of plausible situations which end up, uh, that end up taking them out of their sort of everyday lives. Uh, and a lot of people that I know like sort of are within their everyday life and they, you know, like have these sort of bizarre things happen to them, so. Do you think that being a writer enriches your life? I mean, the life when you're not writing? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, it, it depends, like, I would say it enriches, 
I mean, the, the life when I'm not actually doing the work, then, you know, I, I seem to like it a lot. You know, it's largely about books coming out and people, you know, talking to people and meeting different people that I wouldn't have met normally. Um, while doing the writing, um, I wouldn't say it really enhances my life. Like, it's hard work and I, like, don't, like, I like it just enough to keep doing it, but um, there has been a lot of times where I've just been like, oh, this is such hard work, why don't I just do something that's a lot easier um, and less sort of taxing that, you know, you'll be thinking about a story for, you know, you'll wake up at 3 a.m. and think about you know, where this story should go and, you know, what this character should be doing and things like that. And it ends up, you know, it would be maybe nice to take a break from that for a little while, but I don't know if I ever will be able to because <laughs> there's something within me that sort of continually has to, like, work on this stuff and figure out those kinds of questions. Somebody quoted to me once a line I've never forgotten that, you know, a lot of the great stories of the world begin with a stranger came to town. And I wonder, as a writer administering grants for the university or changing the diaper on the kid or whatever you do if you if you have a part of yourself that's that stranger <laughs> I mean came to town was kind of watching yeah I mean there always is that sort of part of me that will end up sort of stepping back a little bit and looking for maybe material in situations instead of being um, absolutely sort of engaged in the situation, I'll maybe step back and sort of look, you know, at things from, you know, above or from the side and see, like, what, in what way I can find this for a story. Um, usually, like, those things end up sort of revealing themselves to me. I don't know, like, a lot of my writing ends up sort of flowing from things that I read for whatever reason. Like, you know, I'll read, like, a sentence or a paragraph or something, and I'll, you know, sort of think and extrapolate on what that paragraph or sentence was saying and sort of switch it around in my mind and sort of imaginatively, like, think of a different scenario that maybe is a little bit more funny or something like that. Um, so a lot of stuff ends up coming out of uh, literature in the end. Uh, I, I've always sort of thought the more time that I have to read, the more and the better writer I am. Um, when I'm doing a lot of reading, I especially uh, sort of keyed into sort of the world of words maybe, uh, and that sort of helps me. Uh, but there is that stranger, you know, sort of always lurking around, I think, in my head, or um, sort of looking at things from a, the perspective of a writer. What do you read? Um, a lot of short stories in the end. Uh, that's the sort of form that I like. Uh, a lot of collections of short stories. I have, you know, my favorite authors are George Saunders. Uh, I love Amy Bender's work. Uh, right now, I'm actually reading a kind of a couple of uh, sci-fi books, which are this sort of a departure for me, but they're, they're sort of enjoyable. Um, I'm working, I'm starting to work on a novel now, uh, and that 
is sort of, I don't know how I'm going to structure it, but I'm sort of trying to figure out that dynamic, which is a lot different from short stories in the end. So I've sort of shifted a lot of my reading toward novel-length works. Uh, and, you know, I, a lot of the stuff I read has a, the quality of sort of being, I guess, a bit cheeky. Um, and having a little bit of a sense of humor uh, within it. So those, that's sort of what I'm looking to do. It's the big decision to move from short stories to novels. It, was, it, was it a hard decision to say, I want to take this on? Well, yeah, I mean, I think I've arrived now at the point where, I mean, I love writing short stories, but if I, you know, this is sort of a crass way to put it, but I, the market sort of de demands a novel instead of a short story collection. And I, I've had an idea for a novel that I want to explore. Um, and I think I've arrived to the point now, like, I, you know, my career path thus far has, has not really been that of a, you know, writing uh, careerist in the publishing world, I guess. Like, I, publishing short stories just doesn't really end up getting you anywhere. Um, and I think at this point, you know, I'm ready to move on. Um, my goal, I, you know, I think I'll continue to write sort of short stories, but I want to try to give this a good go, um, and sort of work on it probably for the next year and see where it ends up heading. Uh, it's a lot, it's a different animal, um, sort of like, you know, like, I, I've always thought that poetry is probably closer to a short story than a novel is to a short story. So this is a different kind of thing. I, I'm obviously bringing some, you know, short story elements and things with, you know, the writing craft with me. So it's not starting over from step one, but it's it's kind of daunting. Um, I'm trying to sort of keep everything in perspective and work on things at a, you know, divide things up into sort of a chunk that is manageable in my head, um, where things are, you know, like the great American novel that's going to be a thousand pages long, where I can have these free chunks of things that I'm working on that sort of all, all of a sudden be combined together. Is there a special problem with doing a comic novel? Yeah, I mean, this is sort of the problem that I always run into, which is you really need to know where the line in the sand is. Um, sort of overstepping things ends up, you know, making things and making things like too farcical will turn off a lot of readers and, you know, you don't also make things funny enough, like it ends up being sort of flat. Uh, it's trying to find that happy medium is something that I'm sort of struggling with right now, where there's the, you know, humor is still a huge part of it, and there's also that, you know, also the poignant piece um, within there. I'm, I'm always trying to sort of put those marks. And the novel that I'm working on now is, it's kind of tough um, at this point to sort of figure out where the line is maybe. Um, I don't want things to get too body. Uh, and so, and at the same time, I am sort of averse to writing anything that isn't sort of, doesn't have comedic elements. So it's been hard to sort of figure that out right now. I think about my favorite co comic novels, which are 
probably Robertson Davies, Salterton pieces, uh, and maybe and the Rebel Angels, and it's like there are comic short stories within them, sure. two or three pages that are really kind of dangerous if you're eating, because <laughs> you'll just choke, yeah. you know. But then the novel can't stay that way, yeah. or you end up not caring about the characters, you know, yeah. or you end up wondering why you bothered. <laughs> it's got to, and and that that mix of intensely funny pieces and something that carries it along and makes it worth the trouble. Yeah. I mean, I mean one thing that strikes me is a novel's an, a novel's an investment. It's a, a period of time. A short story isn't as much that. Yeah. And so if the short story makes me laugh, maybe that's all I need. Yeah, and I mean that that may be, you know, ultimately the, the issue with my novel is that like trying to figure out how to like get those little bursts of comedic stuff in there and then sort of keep things, you know, moving forward at the same time. You know, and what the investment, you know, that you were talking about too is like I am also making a lot bigger investment in writing the novel too. Yes, yes. Like I mean that's something that I have sort of I haven't ever wanted to commit to this. Like if a short story is not working, I can switch to a different short story. Um, but if I get sort of too far into this novel and it's not working that you know that seems very scary to me. Uh, in comparison to the you know, writing short story, where you can just be like, ah, this just didn't work out, toss it away, and move on to something else, maybe look at it later. Um, you know, making some wrong turns in a novel, or you know, not hitting the, the tone correctly in there is a lot more dangerous feeling to me. So. You started out reading bad, you know, bad didactic stuff and writing yes. better. Uh, you started out as a great reader. Uh, are, do you have any temptation to write for yourself starting out, as for people like yourself who are stuck in Watertown, Minnesota? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like that is something that I do end up thinking about and like I think you know I'll, my stuff is very accessible and that's something that I've always tried to make sure that I'm, I, I don't get bogged down in you know giving people stuff that they are going to want to read um, you know my, I, I think Whenever I go and do like a reading out state or something like that, you know, there'll be people in the crowd that have read, you know, maybe a book in the last year or one in the last five years, and they usually are able to like enjoy what I'm doing. And you know, I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, "Well, you know, I've never had you know somebody write something that I found was funny, and this is like entertaining to read." Um, and you know, I tried to read some stuff before and it just it always puts me to sleep. So like that's sort of what I'm trying to do is like make sure that I don't lose that Watertown reader, I guess. Um, where, you know, keeping things you know, I, I think, you know, on the other end of the spectrum I'm trying to do stuff that is kind of innovative in a literary sense, um, but is also able, you know, anybody can read it and enjoy it. Um, so I'm trying to also figure out, like, how that can be navigated. Uh, 
I had the privilege of a few conversations with Carol Bly before she died over, over some years. And I remember her saying, and by the way, with bad government and silly literature, you know, well, if you're going to write a story and there's an island, well, put the CIA on that island and make them be doing something for awful, because don't, don't waste the island. <laughs> you need to tell your reader that the CIA does a lot of really awful stuff. <laughs> you know, you yeah, might as well put the, make them do it over on that island since it's just sort of sitting there. And, I mean, she had this idea that uh, you had an obligation to tell people the truth about the important stuff that was affecting their lives, or was going to affect their lives, and political realities, and economic realities that were in need of uh, a little bit of, of C4, of what, C4 explosive. <laughs> you, you have any of those impulses? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think they're, especially in my new book, there are a couple of stories where, you know, I'm, I think in the end, they're probably a little, a little more political than I have. Uh, these stories are more political than anything I've written before. Um, just in the end, because, you know, I'm starting to maybe ponder those things a little more. And I'm sort of trying to figure out how to wrap that type of story, you know, not like drumming someone over the head with a message, but like getting them to sort of ponder things that they maybe hadn't thought about with that story uh, and with the humor in the story. Um, you know, one of my favorite books is Catch-22, and like that, you know, I think that's an absolute masterpiece, and that's, you know, sort of where I'm hoping my novel can, can go to and have that sort of tone. Um, I mean, that I think that's a great work that ends up, you know, and also like Slaughterhouse-Five, those sort of stories that have that sense of humor but are also like, you know, it's pretty dark and the, the truth sort of comes out within that darkness and humor. Now some writers end up evolving a world. Uh, Davies does, surely. Yeah. You know, it's the same little town and actually the same characters keep coming up. Faulkner has a whole myth mythical world. Yeah. Uh, do you have any temptations in that direction of, of a, gradually growing a country that's your sort of people, and your conflicts, and you know, your yeah, landscape. I mean, I think that's an impulse for, a, you know, a lot of writers is this world-building scenario. Um, you know, and I think, especially with that Methodist novel that I'm working on, there's sort of a scope to it which ends up, you know, being this sort of world that I'm building um, with a, a lot of depth and, you know, sort of this, uh, grandiose, like, number of characters and things like that, that, you know, I, I think there's always an impulse with writers to sort of do that world-building exercise. I mean, and I feel that, like, even within my short stories, that that's sort of happening. Um, you know, maybe on a smaller scale, but there's still this, you know, there's a place where, you know, these people reside and you want to make sure that you're getting that place correctly and describing the people that are in that place uh, vividly and things like that. And, you know, I think that sort of seeps into all writing in the end. Um, at least in, that's what I'm always trying to do with, you know, anybody that's reading my work is to try to end up getting them immersed in this environment where um, they sort of see things that I'm not even sort of telling them. Um, 
and, and so you know that's that's ultimately what I'm trying to do with any story is like create this dream where everything that's sort of happening within the story um, is in the reader's mind and they're sort of never knocked out of that dream. Uh, that's always sort of been my goal, uh, was trying to you know, manage the story in that way so when somebody's reading my work, they'll you know, be totally focused on it and not end up uh, you know, being distracted by anything that's sort of happening. My son, who's a, a writer, got out of Minnesota as quickly as he could for New York. Sure. Comes back a couple times a year. Uh, is the New York temptation, the big city temptation, the exotic temptation in a way? Is that is that real for you? Um. I think maybe when I was like 22, that was a larger temptation. You know, the reality of it for me is I can live in, you know, Minneapolis and not and be able to write. Whereas I think if I was in New York, I would be struggling more financially to sort of figure out a way to live there and also write. Uh, whereas here, like, you know, it, it's not as big of a struggle. You know, New York obviously is a great place to be able to go to, like, literary events and be around the, you know, the people that are there. And, you know, there's a lot sort of happening in the publishing world there, and networking, etc. Um, but for me, I don't know, like, I, Maybe I had that temptation when I was younger, but it's sort of dissipated now and I sort of realize the advantages that Minneapolis affords an artist. Um, and, you know, maybe people in New York are, you know, once you arrive there, you, can, you know, I, I know people that are like, I don't understand how you could make art in Minnesota. There's, you know, you have to be here in New York to do it. Uh, but I just don't, I haven't ever felt that way. You experience kind of cross media inspiration. I mean, from music, from movies, from television, from visual arts. Is there is there stuff going on there? Or is it a pretty straight line? Um. I wouldn't say it's straight line. I would say that a lot of my inspiration does come from literature, but you know, I think a lot of sentiment from other sort of art forms seeps into my, you know, brain when I'm writing. Um, you know, I can't think of any sort of like specific piece of like visual art, but there's sort of the general aesthetic um, that I gravitate towards. And, you know, just in general, like if I see a movie that I love, that sort of inspires me to go work on my craft, even though they're not really, you know, I mean, they are the same in some ways, but, you know, just sort of the storytelling ways. but. Like, I, I'm inspired by other pieces of art, but I wouldn't say that, like, you know, there's, like, a direct correlation. Like, if I see this movie, then I'm going to, you know, go right. But there, there's definitely, there's definitely some inspiration in all of their art forms. So it isn't like movies give you ideas for things you could try in the way that I mean, I don't, I, I can't think of a specific instance that that's happened, but I'm sure that there, you know, there have been times that I've been like, oh yeah, that's sort of a hilarious thing, or, you know, I, I mean, there have been some random things where, you know, I'll see a scene in a movie, I guess, and sort of think about, you know, I mean, in the end, there could be anything 
that could sort of inspire me. So I guess you know the world inspires me in some way. There, you know, I wrote a story about um, this kid who ends up using balloons uh, to sort of lift a lot of different items uh, up into the air that he doesn't want anymore. And you know, I I guess there's a movie that I was sort of inspired by. It's called Donnie Deck Chair, <laughs> which is about a guy I think in England who uh, ends up taking a deck chair and tying a ton of balloons and like floating over to his girlfriend's house or something. I only know the premise of that one, but I sort of extrapolated that into a different realm. So. So now you have offspring. Uh, thought about how you want to steer this new person. You, you want you want a gener you want a, a writing dynasty. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, I I don't know if I'll where he'll get pushed into. Like if he. He seems already like he's a good storyteller, um, so and sort of you know he's four and he's very verbal. Uh, so I, you know I wouldn't be surprised. And he, you know, my wife's family is very literary too, so I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up doing some sort of writing um, or something at least literary. Uh, you know, I'm sort of I'm trying not to impose any sort of ideas on what he should do, potentially. Um, but it wouldn't make me sad if he was a writer. Like, that would be absolutely fine with me. Um, I'm sure I'll be able to give him you know, the real realities of the situation, and maybe that will steer him otherwise. I don't know. Do you, do you feel like with your family now that you're that you're carrying on a creative legacy from your own parents and maybe even further back? Yeah, I, I mean, this is something that I think about a lot, and you know, I think both my mother and my father had artistic. They, they wanted to do something artistic with their lives and that didn't really end up working out in sort of a way that they maybe would have liked. Um, I wouldn't say they're frustrated, like I would say they maybe things like sort of deviated into other forms that, you know, they wouldn't have expected and their creativity sort of flowed from something into something else. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think there is a legacy that I'm continuing on, uh, you know, there, both of them and, you know, previous generations that have been, in my family, have been doing artistic endeavors, and that ends up, I think, you know, sort of trickling down in some way. And, either in, you know, sort of giving a person a license to do it, and, you know, also maybe generally in some sort of, like, genetic predisposition toward creating things. Uh, so, I, yeah, I think there, there is some legacy sort of that I'm trying to continue on, or at least with, you know, my parents, I saw them not being able to do exactly what they wanted, um, just through work movements and um, child rearing and things like that. So I've sort of focused my life to make sure that I have the ability to do that. There's a good deal of unease around about the squeezing out of the arts in high schools elementary schools, the lack of drama departments, for example, uh, just the neglect of that 
it's uh, as a general opportunity for for every kid in the society. Does that worry you? Yeah, I mean, that's something that my wife and I talk about a lot. She works for McPhail Center for Music, and she ends up, she's the director for community um, partnerships. So there's a lot, of, you know, they basically are bringing the music programs back into the schools. Um, you know, and I, I think without the opportunities for arts, like I, that I had growing up, I don't know if I would have even thought about doing what I'm doing right now. Um, you know, I think back to, you know, my elementary and high school, and there are a lot of opportunities to, you know, be in plays and, you know, extracurricular stuff that, you know, was sort of instrumental in just giving me the license to become an artist. And, yeah, I don't know, I think it's sort of a sad state of affairs that there aren't these opportunities anymore within the school system that there were, you know, even 10 years ago. I'm hoping that the, you know, a lot of the PTAs and things understand this lack of artistic uh, curriculum in the school, so I'm hoping that that sort of either is filled by uh, community organizations or something. Um, you know, there's such a focus on testing within schools now, and then, you know, I, we spent some time in Finland last year, and the school system there ends up really valuing artistic expression a lot more than we do here. Um, and I sort of wish that things would revert back to the way they were maybe 20 years ago, where things were music class, you know, drama, were more valued than they are today. You're looking at, I mean, you're looking forward to a really long writing career if everything goes right. Sure. And when that's a, a privilege that, you know, is, well, people have had it, but it's, it's kind of new that one could say, well, in writing 20 years, I figure I've got, what, 40, 50 more. Uh, do you have any ways of imagining what might happen to you in that time, or hopes, or thoughts about, you know, I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, you, you know, to, to be looking at a fairly limited amount of time, and the other to think about having a life to really develop this stuff. Yeah, I mean, this, you know, I expect or I hope that I'm going to be alive for a while. Um, and, you know, so that that is something that is really great, that you, you know, over a period of time can sort of develop your voice, you know. I've been doing it for a while and I'm excited to can sort of continue to see where it goes. Um, I mean, I tend not to be a real planner of things, maybe, you know, it's both probably to my detriment and, you know, that I will, you know, end up, you know, going sort of from wherever the, the, the water flowing through the, the, the town leads me, but um, I'm, I don't know, it's hard to sort of imagine that for me. I, I get pretty focused on like a certain project um, and try not to sort of think, you know, 25 years down the line what it's going to look like. Um, I don't know if that is what a lot of other artists do. I, I think that, I don't know, for me the future is such an unknown that to sort of ponder it doesn't really like feel like a good use of my time or energy, I guess. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't want to say that I don't 
totally, I, I ponder it a bit, but like when I, especially with my art, I try to just like focus on the project that I'm doing, and then you know wherever that sort of goes, it goes. Thank you.